Good afternoon. Welcome all to today's meeting launching the November-December issue of Foreign Affairs. I'm Dan kurtz -Phelan. I'm the editor of the magazine. I'm thrilled to welcome two authors of really outstanding pieces and important pieces that are in that November-December issue. Um, and it turns out to be a very, very timely topic as well. So we're lucky to have them today. Uh, Fiona Hill is the author of the essay, The Kremlin's Strange Victory. Some of that is drawn from her uh, new book, There is Nothing for You Here, but some of it is new, especially some of the stuff focused on uh, the Russia policy questions. Uh, Fiona is currently a fellow at Brookings, but she was previously the senior director on the National Security Council covering Russia and Europe from uh, early 2017 to mid 2019, which as you all certainly remember was a rather eventful time for a whole host of reasons that she covers in the uh, in the piece. And uh, before that she was, and she remains really one of the, the foremost analysts and interpreters of Russia and Vladimir Putin and the US Ru Ru Russia relationship. So um, we're lucky to have her, it was a powerful piece. Um, and she brings as well to that piece, a kind of social and political context that I think is often lacking from foreign policy discussion. So I'm sure we'll get into some of that today as well. Uh, we also have Andrea Kendall Taylor, who co-authored a piece in the issue with Michael Kaufman on the myth of Russian decline um, like uh, like Fiona's piece, it, it really should reframe the way we talk about one of the foremost foreign policy challenges that, that we deal with week to week. Uh, Andre has also done a bunch of other really fantastic pieces for foreign affairs over the last uh, the last year or two, including one on digital authoritarianism and a recent one on the convergence of China and Russia, both topics that I imagine will come up in different forms today. Uh, she is currently a fellow at the Center for a New American, American Security, and before that was one of the U.S. intelligence community's top Russia analysts, including as Deputy National, National Intelligence Officer for Russia from 2015 to 2018. Um, I'm going to ask questions for the first uh, first chunk of this, and then I will turn to questions from uh, from all of you on the line halfway through uh, through our hour. Um, Fiona, Andrea, thanks for being here. Before delving into the uh, historic and strategic depths that you get to in your essays, I want to start with something that's a little bit more in the news, and that's that's Ukraine, which I know you're both paying close attention to. We've obviously seen growing concern about what the Russians are up to on the border of eastern Ukraine. There have been flare-ups in the Donbass. There are troops, uh, troops massing there. Uh, I'm curious what your assessment of what Putin is up to is and how you think the U.S. should be responding at this moment. Uh, Fiona, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Andrea on this. No, thanks uh, very much, Dan. It's really great to be here with everyone today and uh, really very nice to be sharing not just a little Zoom screen with Andrea, who I haven't seen for a while, but also uh, inside of the covers of uh, Foreign Affairs. It's a, a real honour, I think, for both of us. So anyway, delighted to be uh, part of this discussion too. Obviously, there's a lot going on uh, with Ukraine and a lot of reasons why we should be very concerned about Russia's intentions. In fact, um, and I'll see if you know Andre agrees with me here, there are more reasons to be concerned that Russia would go in than there are reasons to think that they might not at this particular juncture, because you know, we have been building up uh, to this kind of situation over a long period of time. We know that Russia has already gone into Ukraine in, in the past. So this is a continuation of a war that was sparked off in 2014 in the Donbass, portrayed as a civil war by uh, the Russians, you know, saying that they're, you know, just basically watching from afar as uh, the uh, separatists of the Donbass and Luhansk region, you know, fight for their uh, independence, sovereignty and their rights against uh, the uh, uh, basically Ukrainian forces who were trying to constrain them. There's a whole narrative uh, around all of this, but we know only too well that Russian forces are in there. It's not just proxy forces. We have an awful lot of evidence and information about this. And there are some signs now in terms of Putin talking uh, about sending in humanitarian convoys uh, and uh, you know other uh, activities that really have the hallmarks of things that happened much earlier in 2014. So for all those people who say, well, Russia wouldn't do this, well, actually they already have. And of course, earlier in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, which for many of us who were observing this had been on the docket uh, or on the card since 1994. You know, this study happened 20 years after we'd had concerns about Russia making a move on Crimea that had been put off and pushed off uh, by um, a pretty concerted intervention by the United States and Europeans. Uh, to dissuade uh, Russia from taking any activity back in uh, 1994. There was a memorandum, the, the Budapest memorandum, that was uh, basically brokered to try to 
um, uh, guarantee Ukraine's sovereignty obviously turned out not to be worth the paper that it was written on, but there was an intervention by uh, the United States and Europeans at that point to dissuade Russia from taking any action. So that's part of the long tail. And then, you know, the reasons why Russia would want to take action are manifold. First of all, Ukraine has been on the minds of many people in Moscow for a very long time since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Crimea, even more so, um, is seen as one of these territories that got away somehow after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We're going to be at the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, this December. Putin has been saying for quite some time, going back to 2012 um, in particular, which uh, was the precursor for the last incursions into Ukraine. The Ukraine is part of uh, Russia's national heritage, part of its um, inextricable culture, you know, linguistic, historical, uh, fraternal Slavic ties, um, you know, completely brushing past the idea that, you know, Ukraine is an independence and separate entity. Uh, there has been uh, all kinds of issues related to Ukraine's aspirations to join Europe, be this the European Union or NATO, uh, all kinds of accusations uh, launched at the current Ukrainian government of uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky about their efforts, you know, to perhaps revitalize uh, the, the potential of joining NATO, the visit by General Austin, uh, our defense secretary recently to Ukraine talks about, you know, NATO uh, engagement and exercises with Ukraine. All of these are issues that uh, Putin has bundled together. There's many more issues. I mean, this is, I think, part of the problem is there are so many reasons why Russia could be going after Ukraine at this particular juncture. And the, the Russians seem to be very much looking for a pretext, either for action now or action at some uh, different time. And I think, you know, I'll just let um, Andrea jump in here. You know, I think how we tackle this is going to be very complicated because if the Russians do go in, it casts a question mark over all kinds of territorial conflicts in Europe, but also further afield in the Indo-Pacific, somewhere that I know Andrea watches very closely as well. And we also have to be, bear in mind that last year, people said nothing would ever happen in Nagorno-Karabakh or between the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And the Russians certainly egged on Azerbaijan to teach Armenia a lesson because Armenia was going off in a direction which the Russians think Ukraine is as well, out of uh, potentially out of Russia's orbit. And we've just seen clashes between Armenia and Azerbaijan this week with high casualty rates again. So I would just say no room here for complacency. And Andrea, I know you've got a lot to add here, but perhaps we can discuss a bit more about what we might do about it together. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, great. I entirely agree with what Fiona just laid out. I mean, I, I think that there's no room for complacency. I think this is a really critical juncture. Um, I also think we should put it in a broad, in broader context. There's a lot happening in Europe at this moment. So it's not just Ukraine, it's Belarus and uh, Putin's support and enabling of the Lukashenko regime to manufacture this migrant crisis and send migrants into the European Union. It's the energy crisis where Putin, if he wanted to, could have done something. But now he's created a situation, you know, I think intended to convince Europeans that they might not want to take on Putin lest they jeopardize their heating for the winter. Um, there's things happening in the Balkans with Dodik threatening to pull the Republika Srpska out of some of these institutions. He certainly calculates that he has the backing of Putin. I mean, we could go on and on. I think we have to see this in part of a multifaceted pressure campaign from the Kremlin on Europe. Um, Fiona already talked about, I think from a military perspective, I'm certainly not a military analyst, but as I understand, um, the pre-positioning of Russian forces certainly suggests uh, that they are at least preparing for the possibility of something more significant. And as Fiona said, the rhetoric in the Kremlin has really changed on Russia. It's, as Fiona was talking about, you know, Putin's op-ed he, where he sees, you know, Ukraine really as just a vassal state. It's followed by the uh, op-ed from Medvedev and Kommersant. It's his comments at Valdai where he's basically moving the red lines. So it used to be no, no NATO membership for Ukraine, but now it's no NATO infrastructure. So he's changing, I think, what he considers his red lines. And I think, you know, just bigger picture as Fiona's talking about this, I mean, I don't think that Putin is willing to accept the status quo any longer. I think he is thinking about his legacy. He sees the trajectory is not moving in a way that's beneficial to Russia. 
I don't think he thinks that any future Ukrainian leader could implement Minsk or something favorable. And, you, and we should add, they're shutting down the diplomatic channel of this as well. So they said no to a leaders meeting through the Normandy process. They've said no to a foreign minister's meeting. So I think one thing that the Russians have learned is, you know, they, they try to achieve things through political diplomatic means. And when they can't, then they have to resort to military force. I think that's where we are. Um, so your question too, Dan, was what do we do about it? I don't, I, I don't think that a, a political decision has been made. I mean, I, I obviously we don't, we can't know that. And so there is, I think, a window of opportunity to at least try to change Putin's calculus. It's extremely difficult to do this. There's no issue other than Ukraine that's more important to Putin. So this is, it's going to be really hard. Um, I think the administration has already sprung into action to try to signal Putin, you know, sending um, CIA director Bill Burns to Moscow. Um, they've been, um, you know, Secretary Blinken put out a very um, strong statement of support for Ukraine. We're doing exercises in the Black Sea. We're on the phones and in Europe trying to build consensus among the Europeans to take the and to see the threat the same way that Washington is seeing it. So I think they're work and they're working, I think, to put together a, maybe a response package or something that we could credibly lay on the table in order to try to deter Putin. But it's going to be really hard. I think that the most important thing to talk about is getting at the NATO pieces. You know, what, if any, role does NATO have here? And Putin has is changing the threshold of his red line. I think it's a question for NATO. Do we accept that? Or should NATO play a more significant role in terms of maybe using NATO funds to create a Ukraine defense deterrence fund or things like that? Those are things we need to be talking about. Um, and I think we have a, a fairly narrow window um, in which to do it. Um, and so I, again, Fiona's point is right on. We can't be complacent. How many times have we said Russia won't do that? Um, and so it, 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 it may be still a low probability outcome um, but we need to do everything possible to try to prevent that most significant outcome. Okay. I'm sure we'll come back to some of these present day concerns uh, later in the conversation, but I want to jump back 30 or so years, or I suppose 29 years and 11 months to uh, the, the, the beginning of this stage of the U.S.-Russia relationship. Both of your pieces really focus on what you argue are kind of fundamental misunderstandings in the way we have understood Russia and approached Russia in the United States since the, the fall of the Soviet Union. So uh, I'd be interested to hear both of you kind of distill those mistakes into, you know, a, a few sentences, the way you the way you laid them out in your piece, but then also consider the, the counterfactual. If you could go back to talk to policymakers in the early 1990s and explain to them what we now know about the course of this relationship and uh, the state of Russia today, what do you think might have been different about, about the relationship and about where we are? Andrea, let's let's start with you on this one. Then we can go to Fiona. Sure. I mean, I, maybe I'll just start with where we focused our piece, which is on this kind of narrative of Russia in decline. Um, I think that's been a very long-standing narrative that Western and U.S. policymakers, in particular, have told themselves. You know, after the height of the Soviet Union. Um, kind of believing that Russia would never be as strong as it was uh, again. And so we've kind of constantly underestimated, I think, what Russia has been willing uh, and able to do. And so I think, you know, in terms of getting Russia right, it's, and I think that the point of our piece is we have to flip the narrative of the way that we think about Russia, that it's not a declining power, that it's a persistent one. Um, and by shifting that frame, right, then that suggests different policy um, uh, approaches. Uh, it's not something where that we can simply set aside or wait out now, expecting that Russia uh, will decline as a power in the future, but rather it's a persistent one that we have to plan for. So I think, I mean, I, I'm really definitely interested in what Fiona has to say, but I think we've kind of constantly as underestimated what Russia is willing and able to accomplish. And so you can think about different junctures where perhaps if the United States uh, had taken a stronger approach, whether or not, you know, we might be on a different path than where we are now. 
Fiona. That was a great barking dog right at that moment. <laughs> and I've asked my kids to try to have that not happen. No, my mind's probably going to do the same. You know, because look, so Russia wasn't a sleeping dog that we let lie, right? <laughs> it was right at that absolute moment of, of, of barking up. Um, look, I, I completely agree uh, with um, uh, Andrea, and I think that you know the, the the piece was excellent on that idea of the persistent power because Russia has been persistently underestimated throughout its history. You know, European um, uh, powers in the neighborhood, uh, you know, constantly, um, you know, uh, I would say uh, did the same, underestimating Russia's ability to deploy resources and to marshal resources, particularly military losses, uh, resources and to learn from its mistakes. And, you know, we were off Russia after the Russian Revolution in uh, the early part of the 20th century. And, you know, eventually over time, you know, they bounced back again. And, you know, that in itself is a frame. You know, Russia is a country that's undergone what's appeared to have been two state collapses um, at the beginning, at the end of the 20th century. But in many respects, the same geography remains, the same core, the same resources and the same kind of ability, again, to marshal particularly the military aspects of power. Even if, you know, we might have questions about its demography, its economy, that natural resource base of Russia and that singular focus on its security have always enabled it. Uh, to, you know, kind of punch well above, you know, what the weight that we would apply uh, to uh, Russia's power always is. It remains the world's largest landmass, for one thing. So Russia has an awful lot of resources going for it and, you know, is able to uh, use things uh, very effectively. Uh, but that frame of loss and that kind of uh, focus on security is something we always have to bear in mind. Because, you know, Russia is never going to see security in the same way as everyone else. You know, it's a uh, you know, fact that it always wants to eliminate all risk. It always looks at others that might impinge upon security and do it harm and wants to remove their capabilities and their capacities for action. There's always a pre preemptive element in uh, Russia's uh, approach to things, especially after the great shock of World War II of Operation Barbarossa, when the Germans invaded and took uh, you know, Hitler by surprise, because Hitler had been talking himself, uh, rather uh, Stalin had been talking himself into uh, the idea that Hitler would not uh, invade. And of course, there was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and this whole idea that somehow they had been, uh, they had created a strategic imperative that ought to happen. And that clouds an awful lot of Russian thinking today because they were caught out and they have every intention of not being caught out again. And this is you know, one of the problems when we go back to the 1990s, and our whole approach to NATO and NATO's relationships with Russia. And I think, you know, one of the turning points is 1999 and the NATO bombing of Belgrade uh, during the Balkan Wars. Because at that point for the Russians, it kind of reminds them of that sort of same kind of lesson as before, that when you have a military alliance or another, you know, kind of opponent has military capabilities, there's a pretty strong likelihood that they will use it. And that's what Putin is trying to get us to understand today, that he's already crossed the military threshold of use many times. We always worried, of course, that he'll cross the threshold of nuclear use as well and the tactical nukes in a battlefield that they've been signaling at times. And we're having this whole big debate about our first use uh, nuclear doctrine at the moment that they're watching very carefully. The Russians are always worried that if we have the capability and capacity, that we will use it. And they've made it very clear that they will use it too that they will cross that threshold and they have on multiple occasions. And NATO 1999, the bombing of Belgrade is a seminal moment in that uh, period because we'd been telling Russia that NATO was no longer a military alliance that was arranged against them. And what they saw in the case of our bombing of Belgrade is that they could be. And they worry every time about a conflict in their um, neighborhood that they have vested interests in like Ukraine or Belarus Back at the time in 1999, it was Chechnya, uh, basically a region within their own territory uh, that they'd had multiple rounds of conflict uh, with. And they worried that actually, if they looked at uh, what um, Serbia was doing in Kosovo, that maybe we might think the same thing about Chechnya and Russia. And I was in uh, St. Petersburg at that point of the NATO bombing of Belgrade for a conference. And even the most pro-Western, or let's just say, favorably inclined political figures who were at this conference uh, towards uh, the West suddenly thought, well, NATO could be turned against us. 
And so that may be one of the most fundamental points of misunderstanding. We kept trying to reassure Russia, of course not. We were going to have the NATO-Russia Council. We were going to have, you know, NATO was no longer that kind of alliance. Uh, and, you know, kind of they don't believe it. And the fact that the Russia has pulled back um, its mission um, at NATO, because, of course, you know, we caught them out spying, you know, other kinds of, you know, activity. And we've, they've pulled back from those kind of contacts, also heightens uh, the danger at this particular moment. So some of the things that we've been talking about, about Ukraine and about how we've got on, you know, to this sort of situation where Russia sees any kind of Ukrainian association uh, with NATO, with the European Union, with anybody else, you know, as a, as a kind of threat, has roots going back to that kind of period and the way that they saw what happened in Belgrade in 1999. Can I can I press you on NATO for a moment? There's, as, as you of course know, a, a strand of argument that NATO expansion was a mistake and guaranteed that Russia would become a permanent enemy in the post-Cold War. There's a, a great piece by Mary Sarati on this issue, uh, making a version of that argument. I'm curious if you look back on NATO ex expansion and see it as a mistake. Well, look, I was a much younger scholar then, and you know, certainly not in any uh, particular position to prevail on this. Uh, but I would also point out that George Kennan thought it was a mistake. My thesis advisor, Richard Pipes, who was no friend of uh, the Soviet Union and, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, was pretty hard um, in um, his, um, actually was in also the National Security um, Senior, you know, Director for Russia of the Soviet Union and Ronald Reagan, and, you know, really wanted to have a much harder uh, offensive defensive push. Uh, against uh, the Soviet Union at the time also thought it was a big mistake. And I had the occasion to talk to Professor Pipes about it on numerous um, occasions. So I was doing my history PhD with him. And his viewpoint was that, um, you know, we had a, indeed pushed very hard on, uh, you know, uh, on uh, Russia to, uh, or Soviet Union to kind of bring about, you know, the kind of collapse of uh, the Soviet system. But then, you know, we were in that kind of same kind of situation that we should have also been at the end of World War II to kind of put things on a different footing. And he was kind of pretty well aware that uh, Russia, as kind of a new Russia, would continue to see NATO as an alliance that was formed against Russia, as indeed they did. And I saw that, you know, kind of myself in real time in 1999. So, you know, I think there's a pretty strong case made that can be made that it was a mistake to enlarge NATO. Uh, there was even a discussion um, at you know, various points about bringing Russia into NATO, not just in the NATO-Russia Council, but bringing it in as a member, of course, was deep suspicion on the Russian part. But I think that whole idea that Russia would just accept our institutions, our Cold War institutions like NATO, and to some degree also you know, the European Union that comes out of that same Cold War setting is something that it would just want to join without any kind of adaptation. Uh, was obviously uh, entirely misplaced. And as I talked to many Germans who were kind of my age or older, who had been involved in all of these discussions, they really kind of felt that we missed an opportunity to reframe, we could have kept and maybe adapted NATO in some forms, but to reframe that discussion to uh, an opportunity to sort of sit down with Russia and work out a new European security understanding you know, back in that early part of the 1990s. And by the time we start to attempt that in a half-hearted fashion later on, it's kind of too late. But the interestingly, what I think, you know, Russia really wants, and I'll see if Andrea thinks the same thing with all of this, you know, bellicose uh, action against uh, Ukraine is to force us to the table to actually get that settlement. But now there's so much else on it, on the table. The cyber, you know, there's all of the, the other satellite uh, missiles, um, you know, we're seeing, I think they're upping the ante here and they want to have a comprehensive settlement that just basically uh, gives them a sense of what their place is, not just in European security, but globally. They want an acknowledgement that they are the other superpower still. It's now China, the US and Russia, but they want it. And they want also very clearly uh, a sphere of influence and an acceptance of a major role and a major say in Europe. And um, they're kind of pretty much trying to get us to the table again by gunpoint. Andrea, yeah. would you share that basic view? Uh, I do. I mean, I think I probably have a different view on the NATO expansion question. And I think that's largely for me informed by talking with people like Dan Fried and Sandy Vershbow and other people who were working at the time on that issue. I think there were a lot of issues other than NATO expansion itself that also played a role in feeding Russia's perceptions. And I guess it gets back to that basic question of like the you know, whether or not those countries have a right to choose their future orientation. And there, after the end of the Cold War, there was a huge demand by those countries to want to 
move into into NATO's orbit. And if you know, I, it, I mean, it's, it very much is a similar discussion I think about Ukraine today. Is you know, there, no country should really have a veto over the trajectory and the desire by these countries and the orientation and the path that they choose. So I, I think we could probably go down the NATO rabbit hole for a very long time. So I'll come to it, just it, we'll agree avoid with that. Fiona. Um, this piece where we are today, which is, I absolutely think that Putin is trying to compel us to the table. Um, I think it's in large part, I think maybe why they're shutting down the Normandy format. I think they want the United States to play a more significant role. I think Putin, you know, he, when Putin looks at Europe now, you know, he doesn't see the EU itself as a geopolitical actor. Um, you know, obviously he has different relationships with individual member states, but I do see this as really trying to compel the United States to the table so that he can be the peer on par with the United States. Um, and I think, you know, part of this multifaceted pressure campaign, again, with Fiona agree that like he wants his sphere of influence. And I think by him pursuing this multifaceted campaign, he's trying to intimidate Europeans and scare them such that maybe he thinks that he can get them to take a more less or a less confrontational approach and just say, please simmer this down. We don't want a conflict in our backyard. So I think he's driving at that, trying to kind of get Europe to, to make those types of concessions on a sphere of influence because they might not want to incur the pain that he is, is slowly ratcheting up. So I will uh, choose from my long list of questions for both of you, just one more, one more for each of you, and then we will go to questions from uh, those uh, those listening. Um, Fiona, let's talk a bit about your time in the in the Trump administration. Obviously, we all spent um, a, a lot of those years trying to understand some of the um, you know sort of astonishing behavior that you had a much uh, much closer view of, and there were years of um, uh, sometimes overheated speculation about what was behind it. As you watch this play out. What do you think was fundamentally behind the kind of Trump-Putin relationship or Trump's adulation of Putin? And to what extent did you see that reflected in policy? Or do you buy the notion that there was a real difference between what we saw from the president and what US policy was at the time? Well, I mean, there was a lot of continuity in US policy um, beyond the president, honestly. I mean, the actually the Biden administration is doing an awful lot of things that were actually, you know, happening behind the scenes that were hitting the headlines, you know, in terms of um, having, um, uh, trying to have meetings with, you know, Russian counterparts to try to find some stabilization and to push back on, you know, certain issues. Um, there, um, you know, was, uh, however, another, you know, dimension that actually President Trump was not a big fan of NATO. So I mean, that's that that rabbit hole of NATO, you know, kept kind of coming up. Uh, and know, can I completely accept what um, Andrea said about you know the the desire of other countries like Poland, you know, and others in particular uh, to join NATO. And sometimes when the Poles talked to uh, Trump and he had you know personal affinity to Poland, he would go, oh, okay, you know, I kind of get it, you know, that um, you know the NATO was very necessary and that other countries have you know different views about Russia here. But his fixation was on um, Trump's uh, fixation was on Putin. And the style of Putin, you know, who he was as a leader, uh, that strong, powerful leadership. I mean, this is how Trump articulated it. He was less interested in Russia itself. And you know, he, he wasn't really interested in getting into the depths or the history of Russia. You know, remember on many occasions, it, it was quite clear that, you know, kind of he did think Ukraine was part of Russia because of language, you know, not really kind of understanding, you know, the differences and, you know, the fact that obviously Canada is not part of the United States just because they share a language or, you know, United States is no longer part of the United Kingdom, you know, for the same reason. But he just wasn't really interested in Russia per se. He was more interested in the style of Putin. You know, he had business interests in Russia. He'd always been interested in building Trump Tower. That was kind of clear that he was sort of thinking, you know, about that. But the fixation was really about Putin, the style of uh, Putin and, uh, you know, the way that he governed Russia and his perceptions of how he did that. The problems, of course, were the Russian intervention in the 2016 election, the perception that um, uh, Russian intervention had a major role in, um, you know, basically electing Trump. I take difference with that in, in the book and in many things that I've said, I don't believe that was the case. But of course, that made it extraordinarily difficult for there to be a coherent policy towards Russia, because it was always going to be that great suspicion 
about you know Trump and his relationship with uh, Putin and uh, with Russia, and a big um, you know basically divide between what everybody else was trying to do and what Trump himself was uh, wanting to do. Because often he would like to basically enrage deliberately the Congress, the press, you know, kind of popular opinion by, you know, kind of uh, courting Putin and, you know, wanting to have uh, one-on-one -on -one meetings with Putin. So the biggest problem in our policy was lack of consistency and no coherence, certainly at the top and mixed messaging at all times. But behind the scenes, there was an effort to do a lot of the things that we're still seeing now. And that, you know, was very similar to previous administrations going, you know, way back because we've always been trying to find a way of managing this confrontation with Russia and putting it on a different track. And the problem is, as I explained in the foreign affairs article, Russia still sees this struggle for Europe and we don't. I mean, we kind of think it's over and we still can't understand why we're getting trapped in this geopolitical perspective. Although I think we've explained quite clearly in the last you know, segment of discussion why Russia persists in this. It's a persistent power as Andrea describes, it's persistent in its viewpoint and in its views of, of Europe and what European security is about and this desire for a sphere of influence. Um, Andre, I want to push you a bit on the, the China-Russia relationship and how we should see this from a, a U.S. vantage. There are a lot of people here and certainly people in the Biden administration who really look at Russia and see it as a sort of subset of the broader uh, concerns about the U.S.-China relationship, which have a tendency to kind of subsume everything at the moment. What do you see as the state of that China-Russia convergence? And to what extent do you see a potential for US policy to prevent them from getting closer, to prevent that from becoming a threat to us? I mean, especially do you see any, any argument for uh, seeking some kind of rapprochement with Russia for the sake of preventing closer convergence with China? Um, great. So the, yeah, definitely something we've thought a lot about. Um, I mean, I think when you look across every dimension of the Russia-China relationship, the, the evidence points to a deepening relationship. So whether it's kind of in the political, diplomatic, economic, technological, democracy and human rights in the defense domain, um, the, the relationship is deepening. Um, and initially it may have started as kind of a marriage of convenience. Um, but I think, you know, the, the longer that this relationship persists, the more it's seeping down past the Putin and Xi level. It was originally, I think, very much driven from the top down. But the more that these two sides are interacting with each other and increasingly lower levels of government, whether it's technology exchanges, military exercises, um, it's, it's, I mean, I think that's what relationships are built on, right? Is they're built, they're help, those interactions help overcome some of the historic mistrust, maybe perceptions of one another that in the past have been barriers to their deepening relationship. Um, it, I, I think that they uh, have a fairly meaningful and very significant relationship. I think it's important for the United States, however, to be, um, have a nuanced discussion about this, right? We shouldn't overstate it. Uh, there are real limits on what they're willing to do. And so it's really important that we prioritize the problem so that we're not using the banner of Russia-China alignment in every region or on every issue to throw resources and chase, chase the problem. We, you know, I think it's not really a problem in the Mediterranean, for example, but in the Arctic or other areas, we might wanna pay more attention. Uh, the way that we've thought about it, it's the implications are most significant in the defense domain and the democracy and human rights domain. So militarily, I think we see Russia selling increasingly sophisticated weapon systems. Uh, it's making it easier for the Chinese to keep the US out of their backyard. And that's a problem, right? Um, and in the de democracy and human rights domain, I think that's one area where there are the fewest constraints on their relationship. They are very much aligned, I think, in the way that they see the world, their desire to push back on democracy, which they both see as a thinly veiled attempt by the United States to exert its influence. Uh, they learn from one another. Uh, you can see Kremlin, the Be Beijing adopting some of the Kremlin's disinformation tactics. They work together to bolster illiberal leaders. They're working to shape norms and standards in international institutions. I mean, so I think in it, there, there, in, 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 and it doesn't necessarily, and not in every instance are they overtly coordinating these things, but at a certain point, I don't know that that matters, right? And it's, they're singing from the same sheet of music. And so it amplifies what they're doing. And I think that's the way that we've thought about this relationship. I think their partnership is more than the sum of their parts. So yes, Russia is a problem and China is a problem, but together it's greater than the sum of their parts. And I think that's what we have to be attuned to. What to do about it is a really hard question. Um, 
yeah, you know, their alignment is for, a, you know, clearly the U.S. posture has played a role in this, um, at, especially post-2014, where Russia really doesn't see a future in the West. It has reinforced their need and their urgency to align with Beijing. As the U.S. confrontation with China heats up too, it is also makes China a more or makes Russia a more valuable partner for Beijing. Um, so it's difficult to know what to do about it. Um, they do have natural fissures and tensions in the relationship, and in some cases, like Central Asia, you see China increasing investment in places like Belarus and Ukraine and Iran. So that one can hope that some of those natural fissures will kind of, you know, play out naturally. Uh, I think we have to be, I, th this notion that we can split them apart, I think is a fool's errand. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't try to pursue a policy with Russia that's gradual, incremental, where we can uh, engage with Russia, we should that there might be people around Putin who are questioning the knowledge, uh, the value of this path that Putin has put them on. So it's a, in my mind, it's a longer term strategy. It's gradual, it's incremental, but I do think we need to be trying to shape Russia's calculus so that they want some interaction and engagement with the US rather than being wholeheartedly subservient to Beijing. We don't want a Russia that's all in with China. That is the, I think what we need to prevent. Um, the ground for doing that is narrow, but we should try when we can. Um, and so I think that that's kind of, you know, for Russia, they they don't want to be a junior partner either, right? And they're, they have always wanted to be an unaligned pole in this multipolar world. And so we just need to find a way like that to facilitate their ability to do that. We want them to pursue a more independent foreign policy. Fiona, let me give you 30 seconds just to add anything or dissent from anything in that answer. Well, I think that was really comprehensive. I mean, uh, Andrea has really covered uh, all of the waterfront there. I mean, I, I do think that we should, um, you know, when we're thinking about Ukraine, you know, for example, it may not be that China would necessarily welcome um, a Russian incursion into Ukraine. Uh, when uh, Russia annexed Crimea, for example, uh, China gave cover to the Central Asian states and others that were being pressured uh, by Russia to recognize the annexation. And, you know, they didn't. Uh, you know, for example, and um, during the incursion or the invasion of Georgia in 2008, of course, this took place during the Summer Olympics in Beijing, and the Chinese were not happy by the split screen uh, imaging of their opening ceremonies, you know, and, you know the Russians going down the rocky tunnel into Georgia with tanks, etc. Yeah, you know, the Winter Olympics are in China in February, um, early uh, February, what's the 4th to the 20th, something like that. You know, I mean, maybe we can somehow prevail upon the Chinese to actually uh, also suggest this isn't, you know, kind of a great thing to be doing because China is very interested in um, investment in Europe. You know, the, the relationship with uh, between China and Russia is, Andrea is suggesting, is not in a vacuum. There, are, you know, there are tensions. Russia often wants this strategic partnership with China a lot more than it seems, and maybe China does. Uh, there are lots of tensions with China and India in the Himalayas, of course, China and Japan, and pretty much everybody else in, you know, the uh, the Pacific in, in various um, uh, arenas. And maybe that's another way of putting pressure on Russia, or even suggesting to Russia, look, do you really want to get that close to uh, to China? You know, given all of this complexity, so I think we have to be creative. And also not just think about everything through a U European channel when we're you know, thinking about Russia, China, and also kind of remembering that there's a different kind of dynamic out there in the Asia Pacific. So, you know, then we might have a bit of wiggle room here. We're just, um, as Andrea is suggesting, we, we can't really try to force or uh, pull them apart, but we can, you know, perhaps get some more complexity into there that, um, you know, might make that relationship different uh, from what it is right now. We'll go to questions. Uh, as a reminder, we are on the record. This is all on the record, including your questions. And please keep questions relatively crisp and direct so we can get to as many as possible. Our first question will be from James Gilmore. Great, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, grateful for this and I am uh, somewhat of a Fiona Hill watcher. So I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. I actually read your book, Mr. Putin, and I've been watching what you say carefully. Not always with approval, by the way, but sometimes. Listen, I just got back from 19 months as United States ambassador to OSCE. So I met with the Russians and everybody else for in the downtown of the Hofburg Palace in Vienna every week with the OSCE. 
and I've watched the situation deteriorate. I've written on it uh, and warned that after Afghanistan that we had better make up our minds right now what we're going to do. And in the end, when I'm done in about two seconds, I'm going to ask you to the question, what do you think we ought to be doing? But uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. I think that, uh, that Afghanistan sent a message uh, that we're not going to do anything. Uh, I think that uh, when, when I was there, Marshall Billingsley came over and was prepared to negotiate on tactical nuclear weapons as a condition for New START. President Biden went in and just gave it to him, uh, which I thought was another dangerous uh, signal. Now, uh, I, I just got back from Ukraine just a few months ago. I went over there with the American Foreign Policy Council. And the Ukrainians are, are sharing not only their belief of their danger, but also their determination to resist. Here's the bottom line question is, is this, um, you know, I'm, I'm very alarmed, frankly, and I, I'm very alarmed by this, and I think it may be too late. So the question is this, if they move into Ukraine now, what would your advice be to President Biden? Because if he does nothing the way I think that it looks like that he almost be forced to do. Ambassador Gilmore, let's, can we let them answer so we can get some other questions? Yeah, I'll, yeah okay, I'll, I'll stop. Sorry to interrupt. Fiona, what do you, what do you want to start? What do you think we ought to do if they move into Ukraine? What should we do? Nothing or, or frankly, resist? Look, I, you know, I think uh, Ambassador Gilmore, um, you know, first of all, sir, sir, also thank you for your service. I remember meeting you um, before you went out to the OSC and um, you, you really did a, an excellent uh, job out there. And, you know, this, um, you know, issue as you, um, you know, lay it out, this is exactly what Putin is banking on. He, he did indeed, as you know, you're, you're suggesting take messages, you know, kind of or, or, or basically take con draw conclusions from things that have happened, perhaps inadvertent messaging. Certainly, you know, kind of seeing um, the United States coming out of Af Afghanistan. They did the same, of course, but after 10 years rather than after 20 years. Now, China has stepped in there as well. And it becomes another arena where Russia has to factor China in. New start. I actually also uh, share your agreement. I thought that was far too quick. I would have uh, certainly done more uh, to negotiate there. And, you know, the same uh, signals that you're hearing on Ukraine, um, uh, we're all extraordinarily worried about. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, that there's limits to what the United States can do unless it can really get everybody else to pull behind it. And what I mean by everybody else is not just the European uh, partners, you know, like France and Germany. Uh, but it's um, other major European countries that have a vested interest in this. And it also is uh, getting a larger uh, international response. I mean, I think it's probably fanciful to think that China you know, would do something you know, right now, but India, Japan and others you know, to basically speak out, because as you're suggesting, there are so many other territorial and other disputes within the OSCE territory. This is going to you know, turn everything on its, um, on its head. And our credibility in terms of saying no more you know, forcible actions in Europe and annexations of territory. Uh, you know, we haven't recognized this as the first annexation of territory since World War II. You know, this is opening a threshold. We've already seen Armenia and Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh and also didn't do, you know, too much uh, there either. And I think that, you know, just exactly as you're saying here, we have to have uh, a response, but it has to be a collective response. And I'll just give an example of um, my own frustrations uh, with this. Uh, when we had the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter in Salisbury in the UK, you may remember this, uh, Ambassador Gilmore, we had an opportunity to really push back hard on the Russians. We wanted to expel intelligence operatives, as many as we actually possibly could from all of the European countries, not just the United States, who were carrying out uh, these kinds of acts. And we, we found that the Europeans, uh, many of the Europeans uh, did not uh, come forward uh, forcefully. We really missed an opportunity. So really the onus is going to be on us to um, have a very firm response. The UK has actually said that it may send um, several hundred troops to Ukraine. So we have to show uh, the Russians that we are determined to, um, to push back. It can be militarily, but it can be by other means as well. And there's a lot of things that we could be doing behind the scenes to take action that, you know, I, I hope we are, but I kind of suspect that we're not at this particular moment. And that's probably because of this complacency elsewhere. As you say, you've come back uh, from Ukraine, you've come back from Europe, you're very, very disturbed. But as Andrea also said, she's hearing from Europeans that they're not seeing you know, things in quite the same way. You know, and I can, you know, kind of circulate around all kinds of uh, messaging that I'm sort of seeing out on the internet and the kind of public where people just do not believe and 
and believe that this is US propaganda that we're actually suggesting that Russia might take action. But I think we can see all the kinds of signs that they are preparing to do so. Andrea, your advice to the administration? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Fiona said. I think in addition to things like Afghanistan, I think, um, you know, one of the things that has maybe created to this perception by Putin that he might be willing to do something more aggressive is that I think we have sent a signal, unfortunately, that we are so focused on China. I mean, this was also kind of the point of our piece, that we're so focused on China that Washington doesn't really have the appetite for a serious confrontation with Russia because we'd rather be spending our energy and our resources on the China challenge. So I, I you know, I wonder if part of this is Putin's calculating that you know, the United States and Europe and all included isn't really up to uh, a fight. Um, I, I would say in terms of what we do, I mean, I think the point is that Fiona is making is if Russia has crossed the line into Eastern Ukraine, it's a little bit too late. Um, and I think what we really need to do is to be doing everything we can now to clearly communicate what those costs are to Putin. The deterrence piece is key. And I think, in my opinion, I do get the sense that this is, is that this administration has sprung into action to try to build the consensus within Europe. Uh, I'm hearing the NSC and State Department officials are on, you know, either in Europe or on the phone trying. They're sharing intelligence that has, I think, really set off Washington in, in, in its seriousness and the way that they're taking this certain situation. So, I mean, I guess you know, again, I, where I started there earlier in my remarks, right? We've sent Bill Burns to Moscow, uh, where, where uh, Austin is going back to Ukraine. Secretary Blinken has made some very significant, strong statements about support for Ukraine. So we're trying to build the consensus. And again, I think here, uh, to go back to just to reiterate what I said, is that thinking about what NATO's role in this should be. Right now, the United States is by far the most significant provider of security assistance to Ukraine. Some other European countries are, but it's kind of thin, uh, I would say. And so can we work through NATO to either use some of the common funds or other mechanisms where we could more seriously uh, provide security assistance to Ukraine to enable them to fight back um, and defend their own sovereignty. So I think all those things need to be on the table. We're, I think we're trying very hard to signal, and I think we're trying hard at this juncture to try to build, A, the European consensus to take the threat seriously and putting together what potential packages would be. We're also hearing that there could be a potential Biden-Putin meeting again, it, you know, maybe even happening virtually by the end of the year. I think that would be the opportunity for President Biden to clearly and directly communicate what the potential costs could be. That's the way it works best with Putin. It has to be leader to leader, and it needs to be, I think, behind the scenes. So it would enable Putin, I think, to give him a little more wiggle room to adjust maybe what he was planning to do without looking weak among the constituents. So I sense that the bureaucracy is really moving on this and taking it very seriously. Um, again, the, the, just the million dollar question is, you know, is it enough? Uh, there is no issue more important to Putin than Ukraine. Sam, let's go to the next question. Our next question is a written submission from Susan Bear Joshi who asks, Climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the greatest challenge humanity faces. Is there an opportunity for Russia, China, and the U.S. to collaborate in a meaningful manner or for Russia and the U.S. to pressure China to reduce emissions? Andrea, do you want to start on this one? I can. Um, so this is an area where I haven't historically paid a lot of attention, but has really crept up my radar. Um, I just got a new book from Thane Gustafson at Georgetown, who wrote just wrote a book called Klimat. Um, and so I'm trying to get smart on this issue. Uh, obviously, Russia is the number four emitter, um, so they have a significant stake in climate change. Um, I think the challenge in working with Russia and China on this issue is that both countries are trying to kind of extract concessions from the United States in order for cooperation that should be in their interest to do anyway. So for example, we've seen Gazprom already trying to suggest that they should have some sort of sanctions relief so that they can start implementing some of these climate adjustment adaptations because obviously those are costly to implement. So, you know, on paper, of course, the answer is yes, we should be able to work with a country like Russia on climate change. It's going to be terribly expensive for Russia to adapt and adjust to climate change. The melting permafrost is going to wreak havoc on their infrastructure. They're having crazy, uh, you know, horrible wildfire uh, 
big fires. Um, so there are some really significant costs here to adjust uh, to climate change. Those in theory should incentivize and create some ground uh, for potential engagement. But again, it's just with the Russians, they always make it hard. Uh, and it is my hope that we can find a way to cooperate on it. But I think it, you know, it's going to take a little, a little finagling. Fiona, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, look, um, if we um, go back to you know, the question as Ambassador Gilmore posed it, it's going to be very hard to work with Russia on anything if we end up with a conflict um, in Ukraine. So uh, any opportunity to engage with the Russians goes right out the window because, you know, we, we're trying uh, at, at both uh, at all times to be able to do two things you know, deter um, Russian uh, actions, malign activity, you know, be it directed against us and others, and find some kind of way of engaging in, in, in a way that's not appeasing the Russians in some way, but moves the relationship onto a different front. There is some opportunity in climate change, but frankly, if uh, Russia's, you know, goal at the moment is to go into Ukraine, that kind of throws all of that off, because that would, you know, kind of just put us back into another punitive round, not just of sanctions, but of, you know, rupturing of relationships completely. And, you know, obviously might even put us on a, a direct war footing. There you go. So, I mean, that is, becomes a big problem. The other thing is just as um, uh, Andrea is, uh, uh, has laid out here, China and Russia are in com two completely different places. China sees green technology as an opportunity. It's not as invested in oil and gas because it didn't really have the same resources Russia does. It does a lot of coal, and it, you know, but it would have to transition out of. But it sees green technology as an opportunity. It's part of its long-term planning. You know, kind of China 2045, you know, the big plan that they have, you know, going out decades, you know, kind of also envisages China dominating in this, um, in these sectors by, you know, 2025, you know, kind of, and so China's at the forefront. Russia is the land of brown technology, old technology. Uh, it's invested heavily in you know, new techniques for extracting oil and gas, but Russia has not really moved forward on innovation and diversification. Its coal industry um, is um, now profitable after decades in which it wasn't, and this is not the best time for it to be moving away from this. And so, you know, really, really, just as you know, Andrea is saying, a lot of the difficulty in adjustment and adaptation for Russia. There's some things we could work on, like methane emissions uh, capping and tackling together. But again, if we're going to be in an all-out conflict, we're going to have a lot more problems on our hands. And that's our dilemma too, because every time, you know, we want to engage with Russia, we get accused of appeasing them. And I mean, I wasn't quite sure what Ambassador Gilmore was referring to at the beginning, but, you know, whenever I try to sound positive, you know, about thinking about things we could do with Russia, I get a whole host of, you know, emails saying, how dare I appease Russia? How dare I talk about engaging with Russia or anybody else for that matter? So we're caught in a bind here you know, by the structure of this confrontational relationship, thinking of positive ways of moving it, you know, all get back to, well, what is Russia's malign intent here? Let's go to the next question, Sam. Our next question will be from Dan Rundy. Thanks so much. This has been an excellent discussion. I'm in this business. I pay my mortgage on think tank work. This has been a really high caliber discussion. I'm so pleased to be a part of it. My question uh, for the two of you is, Given all that's been discussed, and I, I understand the arguments about NATO expansion versus not NATO expansion, what do we, what can we offer to you, countries like Ukraine and Georgia who would like to join NATO? Over. Thanks. Let's try to get a minute from both of you on this, so we can get one more question. And uh, Fiona, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, look, there's lots of things that we can offer them, but this gets back to our problem now with Russia, because Russia is basically saying that all of this is unacceptable. You know, Russia made it very clear that membership action plan was unacceptable, even that even though that wasn't membership back at Bucharest in 2008, they kind of moved on into Georgia directly related to that. And every time, you know, we come up with a new formulation for Ukraine, you know, various visits, um, exercises, you know, the Russians, uh, you know, basically show that that is unacceptable to them. As Andreas said, they keep moving the red lines. So, you know, there's all kinds of creative approaches that we can take, but every time the word NATO is mentioned, you know, this goes back to those uh, feelings and, you know, kind of perceptions and paranoia of 1999 that I mentioned, you know, Russia immediately starts to react. Uh, whether we could kind of come up with uh, more creative approaches to security, I mean, of course we could. But again, we've got this dilemma here that um, Russia, particularly Russia under Putin and the people who are around him, are fixated on the idea of making sure that no NATO in any kind of form for any of these countries. So it's really put us in a bind here. Andrea? I agree. I mean, that it's, it's just 
the fundamental question and people are really polarized on it. I think, you know, part of the, the problem too is just what is the appetite in Europe for moving forward on these things? I think there's just no consensus at this point. You know, the door will remain open. No one wants to close the door. I don't think that's even being discussed. But at the same time, I just don't think that there's appetite within NATO itself for any more significant moves. I mean, I think we could talk about things like uh, for Georgia or for Ukraine to make them a major non-NATO ally status. I think sometimes that may be more symbolic than actually enhancing capabilities. In my transatlantic community, people are also talking about whether or not we would want to create this deterrence fund um, that I was referring to before that would kind of use either NATO common funds or have the participation of more NATO member states contributing to build uh, uh, Ukraine's military capabilities. So those are some ideas, but I, I mean, it, it, it's just a really difficult question and it's difficult to find consensus on it. And I think that's why we kind of continue to be stuck. Well, one just quick point on this is going to be very interesting to watch how Russia reacts to Turkey in the NATO context. Yeah, because, because the drones have been. Yeah, with the drones, this is very significant and extremely interesting. So I would just kind of put that as a marker for people. We don't have to get into it now, but watch the drones and watch Turkey and how Turkey and Russia interact. Because Turkey's always been a bit reluctant to have NATO in the Black Sea. And at one point, you know, I started to wonder if Turkey was looking for a condominium with Russia in the Black Sea. But now Turkey is actually stepping up into its own historic geographic uh, neighborhood here, um, exerting its own interests in Ukraine, which go back a long way. You know, you know, Turkey once had Crimea under its suzerainty, if not its sovereignty. And Turkey is actually seeing an opportunity here uh, for it to take on Russia in a different domain. So, you know, I think watch that space too. Watch the drones is a good tagline for this, uh, this hour. Um, Sam, let's get one more quick question in. Our next question is a written submission from Jay Markowitz, who asks, how do Russia actions in how do Russian actions in Ukraine inform and influence what China will do in Taiwan? And how does should Taiwan influence the US response to conflict in Crimea? Uh, huge question. Let's do 45 seconds from each of you trying to shed some light. Uh, Andrea, why don't you start? So I think what's clear is that these two theaters are now linked um, and we have to think very carefully about how what we do in Ukraine, uh, how the way that that sends signals to Xi and that might shape his calculus for his appetite for more aggression in the Indo-Pacific. So um, I, I think just to be short, the two theaters are linked and so we can't kind of take one in isolation from the other anymore. And that's, you know, kind of why I was suggesting earlier that we want, might want to engage with countries like India and Japan, uh, because, um, you know, Turkey has got its own interest in Ukraine and the Black Sea. Turkey is taking, you know, kind of steps that are not necessarily coordinated with NATO, even though it's a NATO member. India and China had an exchange in the Himalayas over a territorial dispute, and they've been a, a servicemen were killed on either side. That's just, you know, uh, a very short time ago. Uh, you know, the Indians should not be interested in Russia moving into Ukraine, because again, as uh, Andre is saying, this could set the table for not just Taiwan, but for other ter territorial disputes that China has. Uh, Senkaku, Spaklis, uh, Scarborough Shoals. China has shown, of course, that Taiwan is uh, paramount in its interest, but all these places it's claiming, are, you know, it's in its interest as well. And so for Japan, that has a complex set of relationships with Russia, you know, as well as uh, China, but also interests in Ukraine and the Black Sea and elsewhere, you know, there's also some leverage there. So, you know, if I were, uh, you know, trying to think about this now, I'd try to think about other countries that we could bring in to put pressure on Russia, you know, through their own relationships because of their own concerns about territorial disputes. Japan, of course, has a territorial dispute still with, uh, with Russia, but China is much more of an existential threat to Japan at this point than Russia is. So, I mean, there's other ways of getting at this because as Andrea said, these things are linked. And the, th the interesting thing, the India piece is, is really interesting. And I think that yeah. is a really important kind of fissure in the relationship. So what, you know, recommendations we've made in the past too would be to allow Russia to, to sell, um, weapons to India because India needs those in order to deter uh, Chinese aggression. So those are potential fissures. And in some cases, we just need to allow the natural tensions in their relationship to really play out. Sure. Um, everyone who has not read the fantastic pieces by Fiona and Andrea in the new issue should go ahead and do that. Go ahead and buy Fiona's uh, wonderful book, which covers this and much more. Uh, Andrea, Fiona, thank you so much for the, the essays and for joining us today. It's been great to have you.